Hello, hello. Welcome everyone to Diverse Voices dedicated to sharing leadership stories with viewers. Hi, LinkedIn. Hi, YouTube. I see everything's loading on my second screen um, for the hundred odd people who are supposed to be joining us today. We'll see how that turns out. I invite everyone to say hello, share your location. Uh, we're going to have a really engaging conversation today with Aliza Crespo. Hi, Aliza. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm fantastic today. It's so great to see you and hear your voice. I'm really thrilled for today's conversation. For our guests and our viewers, just to set up the conversation, many, com many companies are actively working to foster inclusion through thoughtful conversations, provide an opportunity for leaders to think differently about their workforce workplace and marketplace. So today we shine a light on National Hispanic Heritage Month celebrated in the United States every day from September uh, for the month of from September 15th to October 15th. And during this month, we encourage you to consider the history, cultures and contributions of Hispanic and Latinx Americans. Um, I'm super excited again to have you here. For our audience, um, Elisa, Crespo is an American activist, nonprofit executive, and public servant from New York City. She is the executive director of the New Pride Agenda, whose mission is to set and frame the new policy agenda and focus areas for LGBTQIA rights in the state of New York. We're going to talk a little bit about her heritage, intersectionality, um, and today's conversation focusing on embracing our Hispanic and Latinx community with Eliza's work lived a uh, work and lived experiences. Forgive me, it's a little glitchy today. Um, Elisa, uh, it's I think a great way to start us off, perhaps to talk a little bit about your background. When we were chatting the other week in preparation for this call, I was really taken by the way you sort of arrived at perhaps embracing your heritage in a way that I think is unique to yourself, but also helps others understand that not everyone embraces who they are from the moment they are born um, and their place in the world. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit of that story? Absolutely. Um, and I want to hone in on a word that is important for someone like me, which is um, intersectionality. It is a word that is thrown around quite often these days, um, but I'm not quite sure people fully understand what it means. And so my arrival in embracing my identity has had multiple uh, paths. One in uh, my, my heritage, in my uh, ethnicity, in my background, and one in my, my gender identity and expression. Um, as you mentioned, you know, my name is Elisa Crespo. I'm a trans Latina advocate here uh, in the state of New York and the executive director of New Pride Agenda. Um, my journey into embracing myself has been interesting with respect to um, my Latinx identity. Um, I'm of Puerto Rican descent. Um, I grew up in a household where we didn't really unpack what that meant. We sort of just uh, took it and ran with it. We all understood um, that we were Latinos or Latinx, um, but we didn't really talk about what it meant to be multiracial, to be uh, Puerto Rican, to have ancestors from uh, the Caribbean islands of Puerto Rico, and historically what that means in terms of uh, the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism and imperialism. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I, I did a uh, ancestry DNA uh, test um, when they were becoming very popular. And uh, I think it was, it, someone bought it for me as a birthday gift, actually. And so I, I did it and I sent it in and, and then the results came back. And, and I had always known that I was, uh, my DNA was going to come back um, a percentage uh, indigenous, a percentage um, you know, European and a, and a percentage of, of African. Um, 
But when I had gotten the results of it, um, a, pur a purality of my DNA was from, from Southern Europe, from the Iberian Peninsula, um, which would be modern day Spain or Portugal. Um, and for me, that was an, it was a moment of identity crisis to have to, to, to understand that a, a large part of, of my DNA came from, from, from the colonizer of, of the island in which my ancestors um, came from, which is Puerto Rico. And, and it was a struggle for me. I was a college student. I was learning a lot about you know, liberal politics and about um, race relations and, and all of these things that you learn once you become a young adult and you attend a university. Um, and, and it was, um, admittedly, it was, it was challenging for me to accept that I, I, I had wanted the, the breakup to be, uh, the numbers to be different, but ultimately had to learn that I couldn't, I couldn't control the history, uh, of this, of this world and, uh, of what had gone on, uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, but it's an interesting thing, I would say, just to bring it all home for people of, of, who come from Latin America, who come from the Caribbean, who are historically multiracial, um, to to understand who they really are and what that really means, and how to connect to it in a meaningful and a, in a deep way. I I really appreciate the way you've shared that journey and and that sense of self discovery and the conflict that you may have felt as you were figuring out that um, in some ways you're not just one person. You don't just fit in one box. Mm -hmm. And I've often found it intriguing when others may celebrate, for example, their Italian heritage as if they're one, like as if their heritage is pure, when that is not often the case. I mean, if we look back, um, there's this web that is weaved behind us or and and creates us i think that that it offers the opportunity for for us to discuss a little bit about the everyday issues and using that intersectionality to really build diverse coalitions um, you know there there's that element where um, heritage months overlap one to the next where heritage days appear within heritage months. Uh, I, I, I try to be sensitive when we, um, when we transition from um, one history month to the next, not to step on the toes of those who may see themselves perhaps more purely in an arena. So when we're, when we're talking about building those diverse coalitions, can you share a little bit perhaps of of how you've you've seen that in either your work or your life, and and perhaps how you even see that need of building diverse coalitions. Well, I think diverse coalitions are um, extremely important, in particularly in this day and age. Um, I what comes to my mind is is advocacy, um, which is the world that I'm in, and. You know, the LGBTQ community is a small community. And when you break it down even further, the transgender community is an even smaller community. And so often um, I find that we have to have um, real co-conspirators and allies in the work that we do um, to help us move ahead. Um, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, with respect to advocacy, Diverse coalitions are important. We have to understand that there there is um, overlap in our struggles, right? Um, the struggle for civil rights in the African American community um, has a lot of overlap with the struggle for human rights with the LGBTQ community. Um, these days, when we talk about reproductive rights, we talk about it in a more uh, inclusive way, understanding that even trans men um, have abortions sometimes, and so. I think um, moving into 2022, we are understanding that the importance of diverse and broad coalitions, because no one, no one wins by themselves. 
Um, and it's important to have uh, large coalitions to be able to to move the ball and to, to make progress on, on some of these larger issues that we face uh, on a societal level. Yeah, there's, there's an element of my own collective memory that, that um, pops up as you expressed the idea of civil rights and how we can all work together. My background is I'm, a, I'm of the Jewish faith and um, my ancestors came to this country in the early 1900s. But when the civil rights era really started to take hold, when I look back on history, I'm often impressed by those of us who have a heritage of, in essence, being part of the slave trade, though mine was centuries before, and how so many of those with Jewish faith traveled to the Southern states and really tried to be part of the civil rights movement to offer their support, their voice, um, their power, whatever it may have looked like at the time. And it strikes me that the, um, the heritage each of us has offers us, offers us a way in to seeing how we relate to others. There's this belief that you're different from me because of whatever background you may have that's not of my own. But I think there's something so powerful about looking for that common ground and that acceptance of plurality can really shape us when we understand it, as you've started to discover, um, as you, you know, understood your DNA a little bit more. Is there a way in which the plurality of your heritage is really framing your identity, um, especially as we step into this exciting month um, for Hispanic Heritage Month? Well, you know, I, I grew up in a strong household full of strong women who were independent mm -hmm. and who were um, shaped who I am and the, the woman I became today. And so um, in the Puerto Rican household and in our, our customs and traditions, um, it's quite normal for, for at least in these last couple of generations um, for women to be, uh, be strong-minded and to, to be uh, independent and to make decisions for themselves and to not be codependent um, mm -hmm. upon anyone. And so um, I think that had everything to do with um, my identity and my heritage. Um, and so I, I owe everything to, to people like my, my mother and my godmothers and oh, my aunts and my sisters, um, who even though they were uh, working class and working poor and struggling, um, made it look easy, uh, always mm. provided for us in a way that that sort of fight and struggle came from the decades and the centuries of what it meant uh, for uh, Puerto Rican women to be struggling uh, before we had came to the mainland when, when mm. Puerto Rican people were for all intents and purposes um, mainly inhabiting the island before we had this uh, Exodus in the early 1900s and then the 1950s. Uh, all of that is deep rooted and comes with us from from being um, in the 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 Latin American culture that exists in the Caribbean um, and the struggle for women's rights. Um, and so, you know, I use the word Latinx or Latino mm -hmm. or Latina. Um, it's a more uh, I would say authentic word. Um, I think that you'll find, though, that the Latinx community, um, which is something else I think is important to discuss here, is in no way, shape, or form a monolith. In many respects, the same uh, as is true for the LGBTQ community. Um, we all, we have lots of dif disagreements amongst our both of those communities, um, and so we have. I like to use the word Latino or Latinx. Um, Hispanic is more of a word uh, for me personally that comes stems more from a, um, uh, 
it just feels very sort of uh, colonial or mm -hmm. forced upon uh, the Latino community. Um, it's it's a word that I don't think we had any uh, say or control uh, of, of creating and coming about. Um, it's, it's a little antiquated, if, uh, to say the least. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I really appreciate, and, and I would have, I don't think of the Latino community as a monolith, um, but I really appreciate that for some, using the word Hispanic is perhaps thrust upon, mm -hmm. even though it is, um, it is recognized and that is the, the term for the month we are entering today. Um, but I, but I think it becomes something that um, those of us who are not of right. or don't recognize that aspect of heritage, if we don't think it's because I don't think that's part of, I don't know of anyone in my family tree that identifies in that way. Um, we're, for the most part, Eastern European. Um, I'd have to look much deeper as you did to understand um, where we intersect potentially with the Latino community. And you but would find a lot of people who are a lot of uh, people who are of Latinx descent who are comfortable with the word Hispanic. And then you would also mm -hmm. find some who are not. Um, and so it, it just goes back to what I was saying about um, the Latinx community not being a monolith. And I also think of politically how we are not a monolith. Um, mm -hmm. Politically, the Latinx community um, is, is very... Uh, uh, broken up into into different viewpoints. Um, you know, you have a, a, a sort of a generational divide. Um, you have a, a, a faith-based divide, an older generation that is uh, very deep into their uh, religious uh, belief um, and tends to be more socially conservative on issues of abortion and gay rights. Um, and then you have a more a younger and progressive uh, Latinx a group of people who tend to um, be less uh, practice religion less than say mm -hmm. their their um, the generation before them or the one before that and, and are a lot more open and, and accepting of, of different identities and sexual orientation and gender identity and things of that nature. Yeah, it's it's very fascinating how um, in many ways thanks to social media and the increase in movement of populations as the 20th century and the 20 transition to the 21st century, how the younger generations, whatever we may describe as younger compared to whomever is older, mm -hmm. um, are a bit used to and, and open to um, those that are different from themselves because they now get to experience those individuals and those worlds that they may not have had exposure to perhaps when people were less traveled or saw um, were exposed to um, to a limited worldview but i do want to circle back uh, to your elements of identity because i think that's that's a really a touchstone of the conversation so far and, and I'm curious, how does your identity as a trans person intersect with your identity as part of the Latinx community? Um, and is that something that's that's important to you as you're engaging with others, especially in your work? Well, I think it's everything, right? It's, it's, it is who I am. I am both a, a Latina and both a trans woman. Um, I cannot separate those two things. Um, they intersect. Um, mm -hmm. And so how I show up in the world has everything to do with that. Um, and so I think it, it has certainly shaped my view, um, my experience um, in, in many different respects. Um, but I always think about the diversity that exists within the Latinx community. I always come back to that because all of our experiences are different. And identity for me is something that I'm continuing to learn and discover about myself. Um, but I, 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 I always think about how 
how diverse we are in the Latinx community. You know, we come in all different colors and shapes and sizes, and and many people from uh, from all different uh, heritages come in different uh, colors and shapes and sizes. I mean, it's it's true across the board. But when we speak about race, we speak about it in a very black and white uh, point of view, right? Where what, what we understand that to mean colloquially in, 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 the, in the modern era or day, you know, is where I think Latinx people are, are unique in that the majority of people who come from, who understand themselves to be white, show up and present and look a certain way, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, in the, with respect to their phenotypes. And, and it's the same for, for people who consider their, some, themselves to be black. But when we talk about Latinx people and Latinos, we, we're talking about people who can, who struggle to understand who, how they identify. Do they identify as white? Or do they identify as black? Um, what does that mean to be Latinx? Is something that even this till this day, I, I am admittedly still learning and figuring out. Um, is it about skin color? Is it a, what, what is it really about? And so, and then. Uh, all of this boils down to the fact that much of this is a social construct that we have decided is just is is factual, and we we operate in the world whereas as is as if race really does exist because it does shape our experiences, our identities, our skin colors, our socioeconomic status. All of these things really do shape how we move around and operate in this world with the understanding of, of these social norms and constructs have been created and are so steep and entrenched in who we are um, as a country and as a world. Yeah. It, in the way in which you brought that up, it, I think about the, the polarization that comes from seeing I'm part of something, you're not part of something, whatever that construct may look like. And for me, what ties the Latino community together is simply, in essence, a connection to Latin America, um, as it was known in, in geopolitical forces. But there's always, for me, this aspect of like being part of a team, um, which can be interesting. It can give a, an individual a sense of belonging, but it also can create those who are not. Um, and in its simplest terms, I think of it like a sports team. What, you know, sure, you root for the home team, but there's also something sad about wanting the defeat of others. And when you carry that idea of conflict over in, in a sense of race or, or geopolitical construct, it can be very dangerous because what happens if we all find ways to work together for the betterment of society? Well, of course, that brings up the idea of, of a shared worldview, which we obviously know not everyone sees the world the same way. And, and that can be, um, it can create a lot of barriers. Um, you started to express some of the barriers that you faced, but also um, ways in which you saw the women in your life as um, aspirational individuals and um, ones you could find ways to emulate and respect and uh, represent as you embrace your sense of self and your ever evolving identity. I mean, I, I, I have through this journey and conversations like this, I'm discovering aspects of my identity I wasn't really aware of and didn't really appreciate. I mean, sometimes we don't really have control over what we understand to be identity. Sometimes it's already defined for us. And so these mm -hmm. are very complex uh, topics, conversation um, that we are having here, but, but necessary and important ones. And to go back to your larger point about um, feeling like you're a part of a team um, when you fit, when you identify with a certain um, 
group of people, whether that be based on your ethnicity or your your race or or your heritage, however you want to describe it, um, it does have benefits, but it also has uh, there are also some uh, negative aspects too. And I think on a global and larger scale, mm -hmm. there are problems that the world faces that we cannot solve if we continue to put ourselves in these boxes or if we continue with this sort of obsession with uh, our nationalities or our, our ethnicities, if, uh, if you will. Um, so I think that we, we have to come to an understanding as, as human beings. Um, we have to see the ways in which we are more similar and connected to each other and united um, in order to tackle some of these larger problems that no one country can tackle on their own. Certainly. So I, there, there's so much in the way in which our, our leaders um, perhaps have guided us in a direction that doesn't benefit the masses in a way that truly benefits all. Um, you know, resources are limited. Um, people are, are not expendable. Uh, the lives they lead are, are really valuable. And um, I'm thinking of a bit of our previous conversation and the discussion around ways in which leaders can embrace the Latinx community during Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'd really appreciate your view on what you believe leaders can embrace, maybe one or more things uh, to really support and embrace the Latino community. Well, with respect to Lat Latina women, I, I always think about pay equity and the wage gap. We are at the bottom of the totem pole, if you will. And so I think it's important for um, institutional leaders, business leaders, um, leaders of corporations or organizations to really think about that when they are um, bringing people onto their team when they're specifically bringing on uh, Latinx people, Latinx women and femmes, um, to think about the ways in which uh, you have power and privilege um, and how you can actually do away with the statistics and the trends that are pointing in the wrong direction with respect to income inequality. Um, there's no one suffering more uh, economically um, than, than Latina women. And then if you want to go even further than, than queer Latina women. Mm. Um, and so these are things that I, I, I believe that people are thinking about more and talking about more, particularly as we are talking more about DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion work and anti-racism work. Um, what we have to be careful because there's a very thin line between tokenization and intentionality. Mm -hmm. um, people know when things are being done just to check off a box, just to be able to, to show something. And people know when things are being done intentionally and when they're being done, um, when they're really trying to get at the core issue of, of um, making institutions and organizations more diverse and inclusive. And so I urge leaders and people who do this work um, to, to constantly be thinking about that and considering ways in which they do this DEI work. Um, and I think the most important thing to take away is that we have to listen to the people who are directly impacted, whether we're doing DEI work based off of people's um, backgrounds or ethnicity or race or gender identity or sexual orientation. Uh, we have to bring those people into the fold and really speak to them and ask them, um, how can we make our organization or institution more inclusive and more diverse? And and listen to, to those people and, and take that feedback and, and really try and implement it because only the people who are directly impacted, um, I think have the solutions to these sort of problems. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that perspective and, and bringing forth issues of equal pay. I'm reminded that 
I think it was just today or yesterday, um, the National Soccer League, and I'm not very aware of sports, but I, this headline caught me, announced that they would have the same contracts for the men's league and the women's league, which I know has been an uphill fight for a number of years. And I, I start to reflect on um, the conversations that we were privy to as consumers, as, as just the public, and some of the back talk that was coming about around um, women's request and expectation that they be paid equally and fairly as men, that, that raising the floor would benefit everyone. And your, your statement around intentionality and how so many out in the world of the, so many of the public can tell when in essence, there's just lip service to a statement or a goal. I often advise, and it sounds like you do as well, not only to be intentional, but for leaders to set goals. Uh, in my work in corporate social responsibility, I recall very clearly that no matter how much an organization achieves, the bar will always rise. And that's not a bad thing. As we look at shared values that organizations have with their communities and the communities they work in, it's really important to appreciate the way in which communities and employees are affected by the policies of our leadership uh, and by the choices that they make. I, I, I respect that in some ways we're talking about at least a barrier that we wish could be broken down. But if you have any other thoughts around another barrier that we could break down for the Latino community, I, I, I welcome that and would love to hear it. I'm, I mean, it's such a loaded, hmm. complex, question. I think about pay equity all the time. Um, and I always come back to it. I also think about um, mentorship and promoting people, mm -hmm. and understanding that that work is also going to come with um, a responsibility on behalf of those who may have the access and the influence and the privilege um, to be willing to take people under your wing and, and, and and open doors for them that otherwise would not have opened um, for, for marginalized communities, had someone that had the courage to say, you know what, I'm gonna do something different this time. I'm going to actually take someone under the wing who I think has potential, but there may be barriers just simply because of who they are and because our preconceived notions of what they may be capable of. And I'm gonna completely do away with all of that and change the narrative um, and use my my influence and my privilege for the greater good. Um, I think people know what 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 needs to be done. Um, I think uh, and I think people are doing it. It's just we, we would we would want people to do it in in a sincere and a genuine way. Certainly, and that allyship is extremely powerful. Um, I. I would like to explore for a little bit, a bit more about your work in the New Pride Agenda. Um, so I know that the mission of the new, new Pride Agenda is to set and frame the policy agenda and focus areas for LGBTQIA rights in the state of New York. And I'd love to hear about your focus on fighting for those um, who, who need an advocate. Would you share that? Absolutely. So the work that we are focusing on at the moment, and first of all, I should start by saying that the new Pride agenda focuses on the most marginalized members of the queer community, of the LGBTQ community, which we understand to be black and brown, queer and trans and gender conforming people, um, elderly queer people, um, at-risk youth, and low-income working class, working poor queer people across the board. 
And I think that this, the work that we've been talking about throughout this conversation um, is exemplified in, in my appointment as an executive director of an LGBTQ advocacy organization. To my understanding, a trans woman of color has not been appointed as an executive director of a, of a statewide advocacy group in this in New York until, until I came about, right? Um, typically trans women of color need to create their own organizations and nonprofits in order to be CEOs and executive directors. But here you had a board of directors that wanted to do things differently. And so I, I really commend them um, and credit them a lot for that because that, that is what intentionality looks like. Um, the work that we're focusing on right now is protecting queer and LGBTQ students, um, making sure that they feel that they are in a safe and welcoming and affirming environment. What does that look like? How do we incorporate LGBTQ inclusive curriculum in our public schools so that young queer people can see themselves reflected in, in LGBTQ history and role models and an iconic figures who have contributed to uh, American history. Um, so we're that's a lot of the work that we're doing. We're advocating for that on a, on a local and a state level to make sure that that is uh, mandated, although I, I don't like to use that word. Um, but at the moment, LGBTQ inclusive curriculum is voluntary. And so it's up to school districts and administrators to decide if they want to teach young people about LGBTQ history and curriculum. So we would like to see that be a standard across the board um, in our, our public schools in New York. Um, we're also committed to uh, decriminalizing sex work, which is a sometimes controversial topic depending on who you're talking to, but we look at it from a harm reduction lens and with the understanding that currently the system we have is one that is punitive and that criminalizes people who are trying to survive and put food on the table. And that's personal for me as a former sex worker. Um, we are also focused on making sure that communities who are high risk um, have greater access to PrEP, a life-saving drug that can prevent people from becoming HIV positive because we see discrepancies um, amongst and disparities among who are the people that are actually benefiting from and being educated about um, PrEP and PEP, I should add, because there are two. Um, we are committed to uh, ensuring that we um, advocate for incarcerated transgender people. Um, we hear horror stories all the time about the treatment and placement of transgender people who are incarcerated. And we would like some uh, standard across the board for all county jails and, and, and prisons in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, we do a lot of, of, of public education and awareness, um, you know, making sure we promote and show uh, queer people in their best element. Um, I come from the underground ballroom scene is where I grew up. And there's an immense amount of, of untapped talent and creativity there. And so we wanna make sure that people see all kinds of diverse uh, queer people in New York and what we can bring to the table. Um, and so we're doing a lot of advocacy with lawmakers and meeting with them and talking to them and, and sharing with them perspectives that perhaps they may not have heard from an establishment LGBTQ organization mm. um, with different experiences. And so ultimately, the, the as you mentioned, you shared the mission of the new Pride agenda. But when I think about it, five to 10 years from now, I would like peep the reputation of the new Pride agenda to be that we, that we really did advocate for the most marginalized people in the LGBTQ community, and that we fought for economic justice. Um, that is also a personal uh, mission of mine um, to make sure that we are improving the living conditions and the economic standards and, and the socioeconomic status of, of black and brown queer people in New York City uh, who are suffering from, from homelessness, um, unemployment, and, and lack of education. And so I look at that as the next frontier of LGBTQ rights in America and in New York, is economic justice. We've mm -hmm. done a lot of work around anti-discrimination 
um, we've done the bulk of the work was always about marriage equality. Um, we've achieved that, but we have to think about what what is left to do, and and there really is a lot more work left to do, and and. and that is what I see myself. Uh, one of my my jobs is to to make sure people understand that there really is a lot of work left to do for the LGBTQ community, even in a very progressive um, and and wealthy state like New York. I really appreciate you sharing that journey. Your vulnerability is is very powerful and. Um, it catch, caught me a little off guard, but in the best way. I, I, I recognize this is, yes, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but also a public forum. And it's often taken for granted that, at least through my eyes, that when we support those that are the most marginalized, that we give them the economic, we offer them, not give, economic security that they deserve so they can become be comfortable existing beyond surviving, right. that it is a reflection of, of who we claim to be as we claim to be part of a great state and some say the greatest country, though I think other countries do a darn good job of being the greatest versions of themselves. I think it speaks to um, what's allowed. Uh, I, I've often said the behavior that organizations, cultures, communities, leaders show in the darkest moments, that is who they are. That is reflective of their culture. Is not only, it's important to aspire, but knowing what happens day to day is, is paramount. And when we find a way to raise the floor and give everyone a way to be productive, to contribute to their community, to society, to support their family in whatever way they can, we are better for it. That when there is a disparity that's so vast, even in the state of New York, that offers a lot of strong social programs, we are worse for it. I, I, I think that there's there's a lot of gratitude that comes with even those one-on-one -on -one moments where I think back where I've affected one person's life in whatever way they've expressed. Um, and I know that's an opportunity for impact. I think about those who, I, and I encourage people in our audience, think about those who you've affected even years ago and where they've been able to travel thanks to your support your guidance, your mentorship. There's, there is a lot to that. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a few of the comments. Um, uh, even Angelica is pointing out that your, your vulnerability is extremely powerful and appreciated. There's, there's something to that. So, so I want to give space to thank you. Um, Luz, hopefully Luz, I'm pronouncing your name correctly, yep. talked a little bit about raising the floor. As we, as we part ways today, I, I am curious, um, you mentioned your hopes for five years from now with New Pride Agenda. Is there some hope you have uh, around Hispanic Heritage Month, something you'd like to see that may be there in, in the corners that we haven't seen? Um, that maybe people can appreciate as they explore the complexity of the Latino community in a, in a beautiful way um, and all the bits and pieces. Um, I'm, I'm always hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that um, Latina women will excel. I'm hopeful that Latina queer, um, Latinx queer people, I should say, and, and Latinx trans people will excel. And I'm hopeful that my my journey has inspired people to to do things that they didn't think that they could do, because my really my trajectory and my and my life has been one that has been uh, totally unexpected and something I'd never thought that I would be able to do. You know, trans mm -hmm. people specifically, which is a, some uh, a group of people I will always um, center in any op any opportunity that I have. 
um, don't have lots of role models. It is it is mm-hmm. now over the last few years that we are we have this thrust of visibility and we're able to see ourselves on TV. We're able to see ourselves running for elected office. We're able to see ourselves as nonprofit executives and not just someone that has been offered an entry level position um, where your salary is one that you still have to struggle to get by and live paycheck to paycheck. I'm hopeful that trans people will claim their stake and particularly Latinx trans and queer people and LGBTQ people will grab the bull by the horns and Mm. do what needs to be done and demand um, the equity and demand the the resources um, that they need and that they deserve. And I think that we are at a turning point in our in our country where um, we are finally beginning just scratching the surface about what it means to step back and allow others to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very hopeful. I really appreciate the statement of claiming your stake. Um, I think others don't lose by some who have been unable until a moment to claim their stake. Using your voice in a positive way is is wonderful. And, and I really appreciate you using your voice here to inspire others. Um, I. I have been um, changed in some beautiful ways, I hope, uh, and really appreciate the time that you've spent with us today. I, I look forward to our next conversation. I hope that this isn't a one and done, that we, we get opportunities. And I, I know our, our paths have crossed before this moment, and I look forward to the next time um, our paths cross again. So thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, so much for having me. And thank you for creating the platform to have these very important discussions. And I look forward to doing one of these again. I welcome that as well. All right. Be well, everyone. And thank you again, Eliza. Thank you. Bye-bye.